trying to get to our Facebook page. First United Methodist Church of Elton. Here we go. reason my tablet doesn't like me doing Bible studies. So, give me just a moment. So, let us know you're there. Um, we're going to begin in, in just a moment, continuing our Bible study on the Colossian Creed, uh, looking uh, at Paul's letter to that church, uh, the church at Colossae, a church that he necessarily didn't get to start in person, uh, but was acquainted with and sends a letter to them uh, to help continue nurturing them in the faith and calling them back, really calling them back to that initial faith that they had, that they seem to be kind of wandering away from because of outside influences, uh, cultural influences, but, but even uh, more importantly, influences within the faith. So we'll be talking about that in just a moment. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 3 tonight. I hope you have a Bible with you or a tablet. It's a phone or, or a tablet or something. <clears throat> and we'll begin in just uh, a moment. But I just want to give everybody a chance to find us on Facebook and get started. I'm going to grab my phone, so hopefully I'll be able to kind of watch on my phone. My tablet won't find this, but maybe my phone will. I'll be right back. Thank you for, for joining. This way I can hopefully look at the comments we want. We like to do this by participation. So it, it's helpful if you all make the response, type in the comments. Uh, but again, thank you. So let's begin with prayer. God, as we come to the eve of this day, midweek, an opportunity, God, to discuss, to learn, to dive into your words, specifically the words that, that Paul wrote to the church, words that still speak to us today. So as these words travel across the ocean and centuries, God, may these words come and fill our hearts and inspire us to do the work of of your kingdom, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I mean, well, again, thanks for joining. This is a Bible study at First United Methodist Church of uh, Belton. So, thank you. Uh, well, Paul, Paul had an interesting background. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, much of it, but one of the interesting things was he was one of the, the Pharisees, and the Pharisees uh, tended to be legalistic. Uh, and it's interesting in Paul's letters how he does this 180 from that legalism uh, and uh, talks about faith and grace more than the law. And those that were pushing new Christians, and especially the Gentile, the, the non-Jewish Christians, uh, that they had to obey all those laws that God had given, uh, that's, that's really a point of contention for Paul. But I hope we will remember that uh, for the people that were living that covenant, the covenant that God made with the people after they left Egypt through, through Moses, 
that, that covenant, uh, those laws that God gave in the covenant, that ancient Near East treaty form, those laws were the stipulations of what was placed on the people. And, and it wasn't to be burdensome, it was their part of the covenant, how they would keep the covenant and participate and live in that covenant relationship with God. And so they had those Ten Commandments. Now, of course, as we as humans are, are prone to do, we, we try to figure out, okay, uh, honor your father and your mother. One, one of the commandments, honor your father and your mother, and the, and the only commandment that actually has a promise with it. All right, but then, as we are prone to do, we try to figure, well, what about this scenario? What about that scenario? What about this scenario? What does it mean to honor your father and mother in this situation, that situation? And so on. And then all of a sudden we get another 500 laws based on that one command. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, work in different settings, putting together uh, employee policy handbooks and, and guidebooks. And uh, in, in one context I was in and working on one, uh, with, a, with a team, one of the conversations well, what about this scenario? What about that scenario? And then this scenario, and the person was staying up at nights, I mean, all night, just working all night for, for several nights in a row, thinking of every scenario. And we came back together and had this draft of a book that was uh, over, well over 100 pages. I mean, just trying to cover every possible scenario, uh, which is really hard to do. So, you know, I try to use a model from Southwest Airlines that their employee handbook might be 30 pages. I mean, they really give guidance and best practices and they leave it up to the individual to try to implement that practice in a certain situation. Uh, Disney does the same thing. Disney's number one thing is safety. And they leave it up to their cast members, even people doing the ride, they're all called cast members, uh, to implement that core value of, of safety. So sometimes it's not always consistent. My wife and I, we ran into that when we had our, our young kids at Disney, our, our youngest Allie. She was able to ride a ride one day and the next day she wasn't able to ride it because the person did it said, no, she's too small. So you end up with that instead of having it. So that, that was ha that's what happened. They took these 10 and, and they built them into thousands to try to cover every scenario. And it just doesn't work. And so Paul is really speaking against that kind of legalism. Even uh, Jesus uh, in Mark 7, 1 through 13, so let's look at that. Because uh, sometimes when you fill out all that legalism, uh, it becomes, it really becomes an obstacle. So in the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 13, one day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. Now, let me just say, that's a pretty good ritual to follow today. Uh, not just before you eat, but any time uh, that you've gone out, got food. It, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, this is a great tradition. Uh, the ritual of hand-washing before eating. Uh, the Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands, as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. Now that's a good idea for today, too. <laughs> to wash it off after you bought it at the grocery store. Uh, this is but one of the many traditions they have clung to such as their ceremony washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples follow our age-old traditions? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus said, you hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you when he wrote, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's laws and substitute your own tradition. So obviously Jesus isn't really speaking against hand-washing. 
uh, but speaking against how we tend to take uh, a command of God, one thing, and then we add 50, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 more things uh, to it and try it, and then we become the strict legalist. And it's interesting how Paul, Paul was able to get away from that as a follower of Christ, that that of, of who he was and, and him enforcing that, he let that go. He even argued against that. But let's, and, and that's some of the background of what we're dealing with in the book of Colossians. So with that as our background, let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3. And are you all hearing okay? Is the audio for good? So in uh, Colossians chapter 3, and I want to divide this up into a couple sections. First, we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 9, and then we'll go 10 to uh, 17. And this is where we're going to get into some of our uh, discussion. So Paul says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor, in God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And, and really what he's talking about, uh, let's focus on uh, the things of God, not so much the things of humanity, but let's focus on the things of God. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. So the our life gets moved. Uh, really, we become so much not citizens of this earth, but citizens of heaven. And our real life is our life in Christ. So now we get to the uh, practical application. And, and just remember that legalism part uh, as our background. So put to death, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of the world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, Malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature in all its wicked deeds. Well, that's, that's, there's, there's a lot there. Uh, there. There is definitely a lot there. But look, let's just uh, kind of look at this. And, and the key verse, uh, the key verse is verse 10. For this evening in chapter 3 verse 10. So let's all read it together. Uh, from your various translation. It's going to be beautiful. Uh, to hear all these various words going out. But let's read it together. Uh, verse 10. Put on your new nature. And be renewed. As you learn to know your creator. And become like him. That was great. Uh, but let's go back and look at these. So uh, Paul says to. Uh, in verse 8. Uh, to put off or take off. And then again in uh, verse 9, it's uh, strip off in my translation, using this clothing metaphor uh, about taking off. And it's not kind of the casual taking off that we might do when we get home from work and change our clothes, home from school, change our clothes, or uh, in the evening when we decide to uh, change our clothes and put our uh, pajamas on, or you know, our whatever we're wearing to bed, and and that kind of nice, kind of casual, relaxed kind of changing. It, it is more of the stripping off that you might engage in if you got sprayed by a skunk, and, and you got to run towards the house or in the garage. It, it's it's that kind of putting off and stripping off. There's a, there's an urgency to it, uh, or. Uh, you know, if, if you got uh, fire ants and you got to get some clothes off so you can get off the fire ants. Or uh, the when you experience, and I don't know if you're at that stage of life yet, 
uh, we have those dreaded hot flashes. Uh, and it, it, there's an urgency to uh, taking these things off. So let's just look, let's look at what Paul says that we are to take off. Uh, and I, I have it written as put off. So what are some of the things, and uh, we get two lists, we really, um, there's two lists of five uh, on the vices, uh, verse five and then in verse nine, doesn't matter what order you give them in, but uh, what are some of the things that Paul says that we are to, to, to take off, to put off, to strip off? Donna Jensen, anger and rage. So uh, for those that are just joining, we're looking at Colossians chapter 3, and we are in uh, verses, we're kind of looking at, at 5 through 9 right now. We're looking at the things that Paul says to take off, and we already, we've talked about the background of Paul of what he used to have a legalistic tendency, uh, and, and so right now we're in the negative part. We're going to get to the positive part uh, of the stuff we're supposed to put on, that's coming in a moment, but we're, we're looking at the stuff that we're... Uh, as Christians that Paul says take off and, and the word uh, it was kind of that strip off to get it off in a hurry like if you were sprayed by a skunk and you're running you know run towards the house get towards the garage or the laundry room and get you know get those things off quickly so there's an urgency uh, for Christians to uh, take these off so I think we we did it uh, you did a great job thank you uh, we got the grief Yes. Uh, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Uh, all right. So the interesting thing uh, about these, we, these end up, you know, these are really vices. Uh, these are really, uh, they end up being uh, these, these vices. And with, uh, the, the second set there, we have one set in verse 5 and another set, I believe it's verse 9. I believe it's verse 9. Uh, uh, don't lie to each other. Yeah. Sinful nature, all it sees. I'm sorry, verse 8. Uh, with anger, rage, malicious.
malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. So anger, rage, slander, dirty language, malicious behavior, those all, the way Paul is doing them, uh, and I'm going to just get a little uh, those are what we might call sins of the tongue. Uh, even though anger is an emotion, it's, it's when it's the outburst of anger uh, that is the problem. That's, that's when it becomes the problem. Uh, the same with rage, uh, maliciousness, and the, and the slander, and the dirty language. These might be all what we call sins of the tongue. Uh, on that. So, are, are, you, are, we, are we good? We're, we're, we're together, I hope, on this. Uh, so now we're going to get to the good part. Uh, now we're going to get to the good part, but I want to I want to go back to I want, I want us to start at verse ten uh, again, and let's look at that where it says, "Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him." In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Uh, so there, there's really no distinction. Uh, now, I, Paul uses an interesting word. I just thought it'd be fun to kind of uh, explain it when he talks about barbaric or uncivilized. Uh, you know, barbarism is not maybe how we might think of it. It was actually a, a derogatory term that the Greeks used about people who could not speak Greek well. Uh, you know, they, they say barbar, and, uh, and there was a, a group of people that settled on the northern coast of uh, the Mediterranean Sea there. They, they settled on the northern coast uh, uh, of, of the Black Sea, sorry. And uh, they, they tended to be a pretty crude uh, people. Uh, so that's where they got the, that nickname uh, barbarians. And, and, and that's where it stuck. And, and so it's just interesting that Paul says, you know what, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, north, south, someone from Michigan, someone from Texas, you know, it doesn't matter if you're from South America, North America, Africa, it doesn't matter Jew, non-Jew, you know, we're all one and we're all in Christ. So let's look at uh, verse 10 again. Uh, and let's read it together. If you have a Bible, we'll just read it together. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. So in Paul, and we're going to flesh it out, but Paul first, the, the major thing we're supposed to be put on is our new nature. Our new nature. Because we become new people, new creations, when we have a life in Christ. And, and that is a theme throughout all of Paul's letters. That's a theme throughout the whole New Testament. I, what are some verses that might come to your mind? Can you think of some phrases that are used? Uh, you know, we're, we're new creations. We're, we put on a new nature. We become like Christ. We're, we're risen. We're, we die to the self, become alive in Christ. Just... Which ones might come to your mind? So we will put on this new nature, put on this new nature, be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So the, but, and, and in the Greek and in the Hebrew, in the Bible, that word know 
is more than just a cognitive understanding. Uh, no actually gets into our heart and our gut. No, it is descriptive of an intimate relationship. It is descriptive of an intimate relationship. Sometimes when it says so-and-so knew so-and-so, it is actually not just that they knew about that person or they knew who they were, but it is describing a, a special intimate relationship that those two people had with each other. So to know your creator is not just having this cognitive understanding, but it is in being a, a close fellowship, a close relationship with our creator. And then it says become like, become like the creator. Our creator, which, you know, we're, we're talking about become like God. Or we know that it says become Christ-like. That, that we're to become Christ-like. Uh, but become like our creator. So the amazing thing about this is we are to reflect the nature of the creator. Now, what did it say when God, on day six, when God created human? It says that God created them... Male and female, right? But God created them in God's image. And this is not an egotistical thing for us to say. It is a great affirmation, affirmation of who we are as humans. That we are created in God's nature. We are to reflect God's nature in our life. And knowing our creator and reflecting that nature and having that new nature, let's see if I can uh, do it this way. It puts us back into the Garden of Eden before sin. Paul in Romans, you know, he talks about we had the first Adam, Jesus is the second Adam to erase the, the sin of um, that beautiful parable uh, that we have of that sin of, hu of humanity. You know, they, they wanted to be more than what God created them to be. I mean, that's, that's really the original sin, and that's the, that's the root, the kind of the foundation uh, of all our sin, is we want more than, you know, we want to be more than what God created, or the lust and the greed, we want more, and we're never really satisfied. Because the lust and the greed, uh, those work together. Uh, it's just this uh, appetite for, for more, or the, uh, uh, a Latin phrase that they had, uh, it actually has to do with the accursed love of getting. And, and that really is our original sin, that accursed love of getting. They wanted to get something that they didn't have, and that was that knowledge of good and evil. Uh, but think about the accursed love of getting and the sins that grow from that uh, root. Uh, on that. So. so what it does, when we become new creatures in Christ, it puts us back before that first sin. Now, you might have some questions about that. Does that mean we won't sin? Uh, no, it, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean you don't have to. It does mean you don't have to sin. You probably will. I probably will. Everyone watching probably will. But we don't have to. And it, has to do with our definition of sin. And all this, you know what? So there's all these things. So let me put it this way. You know, you don't have to do any one of these. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to lash out in rage. Uh, you don't have to lust. You don't have to use dirty language. Uh, you don't have to slander somebody. Or do you? I didn't think so. I mean, none of this you have to do. We might do these, but we don't have to do these. In 
the, in our theological tradition, and we have a, a couple other clergy people watching us, so I'll see if they can get this right. Give me John Wesley's definition of sin. John Wesley's definition of sin. Now John Wesley was the founder of the uh, Methodist Church. We're in that theological tradition, that doctrine tradition of the Wesleyan tradition. So John Wesley's definition of sin. I'll give you the first word. A. There you go. What do we got? A willful transgression against a known law of God. In other words, sin is a choice. Sin is a choice. It is willful. We intentionally do it. We choose to do it. It is a transgression. It goes against. We know that we shouldn't do it, but we do it anyway. That is how we operate in our definition of sin. So with that definition of sin, now it doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. We're not going to, it doesn't mean we're going to have errors in judgment. We have to seek forgiveness for all of those as well. And it doesn't mean we won't sin, but we don't have to sin. We can help ourselves. No, not really. God helps us. So the willful transgression against the known law of God. And these would be those. So Paul is saying to put those off. Take, take those off. Strip, strip those off. Um, with urgency. You know, like, like when you got the fire ants or the spray by the skunk and you got to get the clothes off quickly. So, uh, and it is a, a, you know, a clothing metaphor that's Paul using. So we can put all those. We don't have to act in anger. I remember hearing a, a person speak at, at a conference one time, and he said he really had some um, anger was was an issue for him. Uh, and you know, finally, finally, he was able to work through that. But but anger was a, a problem uh, for him, and, and he said, you know, I, I finally was able to get over that. Uh, well, because my kids finally graduated from high school and moved out of the house. No. Uh, he actually went uh, and, and worked through some therapy and some anger management. But this is, when we do this, we're not as inclined to do these. Now, it doesn't mean that I probably, you know, I don't have to get angry on the person on Main Street, Highway 317, that because they've been sheltered in place for three months, completely forgot how to drive. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of those, but they're out there. Uh, I don't really have to get anger towards them. I can empathize, perhaps. So we put on the new nature, reflect uh, the nature of the Creator. So before we go on to what else we're supposed to put on in those verses, let me just pause uh, and see if you have any comments or questions at this point. Any questions or comments on any of this? And, and, and there are no stupid questions. If you really don't understand anything, please let me know or try to re-explain things. I can send you a personal email. I would, lo would love to, you know, want, want you to be able to understand. Well, I'm, I'm not seeing any. I, I want to give enough time, but I'm not, I'm not seeing any. So let's
let's go ahead and move on. We'll take some time. If, if I didn't get to your question now, we'll, we'll take some time towards the end here and make sure we get that. So let's, let's pick up at verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people, he loves, you must clothe yourselves. Okay, so clothe, put on, again, we got this clothing metaphor happening. With tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Again, the thankful heart part, we had that last week. It's, it's, it's there in, in every part of this letter. It's, it's the thankfulness is just weaved throughout. It really holds this together. All right, so uh, let's go back to verse 12. Uh, and you have different translations, so you're going to have different words. You're probably going to have uh, different words. Uh, but what are the things we're supposed to put on? Look at look at verse 12. And if you don't have a Bible, just, just hang with us and, and we'll get them. What do you put on or clothe yourself with? Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so first, let me just mention about uh, compassion uh, was one of the words it might say uh, in some of the Bibles, and I'm using the New Living Translation. Uh, I also like the Common English Bible. It's known as the CEB. Uh, another really good translation to use is one that's called the Voice. Uh, if you're not used, uh, if, if the Bible is, is new to you, uh, the Voice is an excellent one. CEB is another good one. 
Uh, but the voice, whenever somebody is speaking, it lays it out kind of in script form. Uh, and any words that they've added to help us understand, they put them in italics so you, so you know. So the voice, and that's a translation Jeanette and I use in our uh, daily devotionals. Uh, but I'm using uh, the New Living Translation right now. Uh, so tenderhearted mercy or compassion, uh, and the uh, adjective for that is that wonderful word, uh, that wonderful word, uh, my favorite Greek word, one of my favorite Greek words, actually. I don't know if you can see it, it's now, uh, but that has to do with our innermost being. Uh, you know, the, the depth, uh, the depth. And they believe that's where our, all our emotions spring from. And, and so the, the innermost being. So to be uh, compassionate from our innermost, innermost thing. So kindness, compassion, humility, patience, gentleness, love, and forgive. And in that first verse, in 12, you get kindness, compassion, I think one, two, three, four, five. So you get these five virtues, and you can compare them to the verses earlier, uh, verse, uh, in the earlier verses where we got what we were to put off, each of those verses lists five, what would we say, vices. So these five virtues uh, correspond or help to cancel out those vices. So if we're doing these, you know, if you're kind and compassionate, humble, patient, and gentle, you, you're not you're not going to lash out in rage. Uh, you're probably not going to slander. And, and so, what we might say these virtues. Uh, and, and I'm going to come back to them in, in just a, uh, just a moment. Uh, but somebody, would you look at uh, look at verse 17? I just want to touch on this, on verse 17. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So everything you do and say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So those uh, sins of the tongue, anger, anger rage, malice, slander, uh, dirty language. In all you say, if you do it as a representative of, of Jesus, uh, that's going to cancel out what we might call the sins of the tongue. I think. Now, I know they didn't have social media back then, but I'm thinking that a good application for today is whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, should apply to Facebook. Just saying. And Twitter. In all seriousness. So we put these on. Now, when we started, I was talking about uh, how when they, under the previous covenant, uh, and, and Paul having been a Pharisee and, and a Jew, looking at those uh, commandments, those original ten, and how... They just got expanded and expanded and expanded to try to account for every scenario, you know. Well, you got to obey the Sabbath, but what if your ox is in the ditch, you know? Can you pull them out or not? Well, yes, you can. Uh, but depends what you do after you pull them out, you know. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to work on the Sabbath. How far am I allowed to travel? Because uh, you travel for work. How, how far am I allowed to go before it's like, Drudgery and working. And I mean, they just had this all figured out. You know, kind of like some of our blue laws uh, that we had uh, in this country in, in earlier decades and centuries. You know, you could buy this, but you couldn't buy that. You could buy this, but you couldn't buy that. And it just, you know, it's, it's silly. But if we're going to do this, there's really no need. But those laws that they had, they were to live, uh, it was their way of living that covenant, uh, of living the covenant. Now we have this to reflect that relationship, that covenant that we have with God. 
These are the things that ratify uh, the covenant, the way of living that. Uh, this is our guidebook. You know, I was using the illustration about that employee guidebook. And uh, think of this, especially with the love and the forgiveness. You know, Paul says kind of lighten up on each other. If we did this, we don't need to figure out every scenario and what patience would look like under this scenario. Uh, but this is our guidebook for living out the covenant and the relationship. And if we're doing this, then we are reflecting the nature of the Creator. There's a wonderful thing about these virtues that Paul lists here with the kindness and the compassion, the gentleness, the patience, being forgiving, uh, you know, bearing one another. Uh, and I, I like the phrase, uh, make allowance for each other's faults. What Paul was doing, Paul was doing was giving them some of the things that are of the very nature of God. And so this is how we reflect the nature of our Creator. Okay? So now I want to uh, go on a little bit. Go on a little bit. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have some thoughts as to why you think Paul would have to write this to that particular church. Uh, if you have, if you remember anything from our previous studies. They're not really an infant church at this point. You know, it's been a couple of decades, a few decades. Uh, and Paul, remember when, when they started, I mean, they were zealous for Christ. And, and they were living this new life. But then they kind of they kind of got away from that. Uh, and they got away from that because others were coming in. Uh, other Jewish believers, uh, they were followers of Christ, they were Jewish, and were kind of imposing those rules. They know you got to follow all these rules. And so, uh, again, Paul is just bringing us back to this. And then other people within the church, they were doing some self-imposed rules, which there's nothing wrong with. Uh, maybe for you to ex be patient with people and not have anger uh, or rage, maybe you're the type of person that on Sunday mornings... You need to be in the sanctuary uh, 10 minutes before anybody else is arriving and you just have some good quiet time. Or, or you need that at home to, to really center yourself upon God. You know, it, and it, and it, it, it's one of those things. But what was happening was somebody who may say, you know, I, I need to be at the church, the place we're gathering, you know, 10 minutes before anybody else so I can just be quiet for a moment and I can just feel the presence of God. Uh, come upon me and I can feel that peace of God. But then what they were saying was, okay, I'm doing that, now everybody else needs to do that. Uh, we also have that tendency, don't we? That something that's working for us, we go, oh, well, everybody else has to do that too. Uh, so Paul is kind of trying to take all that away and, and just get to the heart of some of the marks of being a Christian, of being a follower of Christ. Uh, these uh, virtues here. Because some of the distraction, it was taking away from the core. Again, verse 10, about reflecting the nature, and then uh, also the, the center and the core in verse 16, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your life. So let the message of Christ and all its witness uh, and all its richness fill your life. Uh, so if, uh, yeah, and, and they were, I mean, you know, it was, it was, they were kind of getting picky with the requirements. So, uh, but 
Like I said, the self-imposed things and your spiritual disciplines, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you're not being legalistic if, if you have uh, spiritual disciplines that you follow and you follow them religiously and rigorously. Uh, that, that's not being legalist. That is, that is what you need to do to have this connection to reflect uh, the nature of your creator. And there's nothing wrong with those. It's just when we start to say, okay, we have to impose those on others. So I think at the heart of the message, and at the heart of the message, what Paul, and I, I was trying to think of better words, so if you can come up with a better uh, sticky line, a, a better tagline with this, uh, let me know. Uh, but the Christian faith, the Christian faith is more about do than don't. Or another way to put it, the Christian faith is more about action than in action. And what I mean by that, the Christian faith, think of the, our core commandment, you know, the greatest command, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that is, that is, an, that is action, that is doing. To where, you know, don't drink, don't dance, don't play cards. Those are those don'ts. Those are really, that's, that's inactivity. But the Christian faith is much more based on activity and doing than it is on the inactivity and the don'ts. What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? I mean, you, can, you can disagree, but what are your thoughts about that? And please feel free to, you know, respond to each other. In the United Methodist Church, when people join the church, they take on uh, these vows, or they promise to participate in the ministries of the church through their uh, prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. These are active things. These are things that we do. And discipleship following Christ is really more about doing than it is not doing. There are those things we're to put off, but those things that we put on are more about doing. The kindness, the compassion, the tenderheartedness, the patience, the gentleness, the forgiving, the loving, the, uh, you know, bearing with one another, 
uh, allowing for each other's faults and mistakes. Uh, it really is more about activity. And I, I, I hope uh, that we will continue in, in the Christian faith and the Christian word. I, I really appreciate Jeanette's comment that, you know, it's a common misconception that Christianity is all about the don'ts where we should be more about the do's and we got to communicate this better uh, with our words and our actions. Uh, instead of saying, well, that, you know, we're going to, uh, the prohibitions on, on this and that and that, uh, focus more on this. Because some of those things that we say not to do, uh, really, I believe if we focused on those vices of, of Paul in here or on our key verse, uh, in verse 10 and verse 16 of chapter 3, if we did those, we probably wouldn't need all those don't, don't, don'ts. But again, verse 16, and, and I know we're apart, but uh, let's read it together. There's going to be various translations. Uh, verse 6, no, I'm sorry, not 16, uh, 17. I'm sorry, verse 17. Let's read verse 17 together. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let's do that one again. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And I think if we, above all, will clothe ourselves with love, in verse 14, we won't have to focus so much on those don'ts of Christianity, but on the do's of Christianity and, and the joy that we get from being a follower of Christ. Because as you know, uh, those of you that uh, have been in significant relationships, uh, married or other significant relationships, have had children or or grandchildren, especially, or, or great-grandchildren, or, or great-grandchildren, uh, you know love uh, makes you do some incredible things. I mean, things you never thought you would do, uh, but love makes you do those things. Uh, and that's what following Christ has to do. It's going to make us do things that, that we never thought were possible to do. It's going to make us do some incredible things. So, again, back to the... And uh, we're not going to do it perfectly, of course, any of these. You know, we're going to have our moments, aren't we? I mean, we're going to have our moments. Uh, or maybe even long, long moments uh, there. But if we just keep this in mind, this is our way of ratifying our, the covenant with God and living out that uh, relationship with God. And so uh, time's about up. I want to close this with prayer, but then uh, I want to talk about upcoming Bible study, uh, where I see us going over the next few weeks. So if you'll hang with me, uh, but let me say the closing prayer. Uh, go forth and all that you say and do, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And be thankful. Have a thankful heart. So gracious God, gracious God, give us your grace that we would have a thankful heart at all times. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're getting ready for chapter 4 in Colossians, and we're going to be, uh, that's our last session. Uh, it, will be our, it would be our fifth session. Uh, so then after that, uh, I, I found a book in a box. It was actually in some books that my wife had, and I think a, a mentor of hers had given her those, uh, that sounds like fun. It, it's, uh, it is being a United Methodist in the Bible Belt. Uh, kind of a theological survival guide. Now, uh, it's not meant to slander or be malicious about the Bible Belt. It's just looking at Kind of the theological uh, ethos 
that we have here in the Bible Belt. The Bible Belt isn't really a geographical thing as much as it is an ethos and a mindset, uh, but in our way, in the uh, Methodist beliefs uh, of what that means and, and how there might be some nuances and differences uh, of how we as United Methodists and our Wesleyan theology uh, might be a little bit different. Uh, we're not going to differ about the Trinity, we're all going to believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or we're not going to, it's not a diff, uh, not differing that, that Jesus Christ uh, was incarnate, uh, you know, God incarnate, born of the Virgin Mary. We're not, we're not differing with any of that. We're not differing that Christ died for our sins. We're not differing that Christ was resurrected. Uh, it, some differences a little bit more subtle, but the core I mean, the core of our faith, as we express in what we say the Apostles' Creed, uh, is, is there. And we're not going to, uh, Christ is not an optional extra uh, for us, that is for sure. Uh, but it, it sounds like fun, so we're going to get those books ordered. I, I don't remember the exact title, but I think it is kind of being a United Methodist in the Bible Belt. That's the exact title. That is the exact title. Yay for me. Let me double check. Uh, now, we're going to get them ordered. Uh, we're going to order some for you. You can order your own. They, it is a book that's still in print. Uh, I'll ask Kelly to... There's two versions. There's two editions? Yes. Two printings. Two printings. Okay, we want the... We want the one with this cover, with the horse. Yeah, it has a horse with a person looking like John Wesley. We will post the cover on our Facebook page. Can we do that? We can. Kelly can do amazing things. I didn't know we could. We'll post the cover. and So if you want to get your own copy, that's fine. But we'll also get some copies of the church. And we'll be distributing those uh, when we get ready to distribute the communion elements uh, for June. So it will be uh, in about 10 days or so, a little bit longer. But we'll uh, look at next week. And then if we have a filler week, I know uh, I have an idea about we're going to do some questions and answers. And not just about Colossians, but some other stuff. And I'll give you a warning ahead of time of what scripture passage we're going to look at. Okay, yeah, if anybody have any other questions or comments, I'll, I'll hang around here for a moment. Uh, if you need to go, I understand. Uh, we try to keep this in hour, but thank you all, and God bless. And it, I tell you, it, it's a joy to see who's watching. You know, people are watching uh, from other parts of, of the country and other parts of the state. And uh, I, I just really appreciate uh, and I, I love to see the names come up of, of who is joining us and that. So thank you. And, and if any of what I'm saying gets confusing, you know, jump in there or uh, call the church or send me an email or send the email to the church. And uh, I will try to do the best I can to explain some of the ramblings that I, that I have. Uh, thank you. God bless. And I'll hang out for a minute. We won't, we won't cut off Facebook Live yet in case you have a question or a comment. And I have to say, when we first started this, I didn't think we'd be doing it this long online. Uh, but even when we get back in person, even when we get back in person, and, and I think we'll be able to get back uh, to the Bible study in person uh, before we're back to in-person worship. Uh, but I don't want to start that with Colossians. I'm going to wait till we start that new study. And I don't know if we'll move to a Zoom format or keep the Facebook Live. We just have a, a slight delay. Uh, but anyway, I do uh, need to take this, so I'm sorry. Thank you all. God bless.